the scheduled meeting of the Economic Development and Regulatory Services Committee for today, which is January 7th. I've been joined by a quorum of my colleagues, including Council Members Cano, Fletcher, Ellison, and Gordon. Uh, we have a relatively short agenda today. I do want to take a walk on item uh, after our consent agenda. So first I'll move the consent agenda, which is item number three, the liquor license approvals, and item number four, the liquor license renewals. Item five are gambling license approvals, and six are gambling license renewals. Seventh is a business license operating conditions for a business in the fourth ward. Item number eight is a rental li dwelling license conditions package. Item nine is the annual annual report for the McPhail Center for Music, and item 10 are adding a couple of people to the Upper Harbor Terminal Collaborative Planning Committee. Uh, these are actually appointments. Um, item number 11 will be a discussion. So I will move the consent agenda, which is items 3 through 10. Is there anything anyone would like to pull off the agenda for discussion? Seeing none on the motion to approve, all in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll then take a walk on item. Mr. Bacchus uh, and um, Mr. Starry are here just for a quick presentation on a walk on item, which was an emergency demolition. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council Members. The property located at 1823 Bryant Avenue North is a four bedroom, two bath duplex that was built in 1902. It was inspected in June of 2018 and again in February of 2019. Multiple violations of the Minneapolis Housing Maintenance Code were noted during each inspection. These violations were not corrected by the owner. The property then became vacant and it was placed into the vacant building registration program on March 20th of 2019. The property was boarded after multiple break-ins and occurrences of being open to trespass. It was condemned for boards on August 26th of 2019. On December 30th of 2019, the property sustained a significant fire damage in pursuant to Minneapolis Code of Ordinance Chapter 249.30. The Director of Regulatory Services has determined the property constitutes a hazard to the public health and safety. The structure posted as a dangerous building on January 2nd enlisted contact information for the assigned inspector. Staff also made phone calls to the property owner on multiple occasions since the fire occurred. The owner did call this morning and left a message with staff stating that he had been out of town. The call was returned, but no direct contact with the owner has been made. Staff will continue to reach out and communicate with the property owner. The waiver of the 60 day period in no way precludes the owner from due process and the right to appeal the director's order to demolish to the nuisance condition process review panel. Based on the severity of the fire and the current condition of the property, at this time, staff is requesting that the City Council approve a waiver of the 60-day waiting period so that notification and abatement may begin immediately. Are there any questions for staff? Councilmember Allison. Thank you for the update. I uh, hadn't quite <clears throat> yet gotten an update on this because uh, I know it was an emergency and that you guys are trying to get in front of us as soon as possible. I uh, just wanted to clarify. So no, um, uh, there's no uh, tenant that was displaced as a result of this fire. Um, no. Okay, cool. So nobody needs help getting a new place or anything? No, the property was condemned and vacant okay, during, cool. the, during the time of the fire. Okay, that's, that's all I yeah, have. Do you want to move? Oh, oh yeah, and then I'll, yeah, I will be happy to move uh, uh, approval um, uh, of the item uh, so that staff can get to work. Okay, great. Uh, seeing no other questions on the motion to approve the staff recommendation, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll then move to our public hearing agenda, starting with item number one. Mr. Cervantes, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Uh, my name is Max Cervantes, and I'm a licensed inspector assigned to the first precinct. I'm presenting an application from Loose Wiles Freehouse, owned by Blue Plate Restaurant Company, Inc. The business address is 701 Washington Avenue North, which is located in Ward 3. Uh, the current license is an on-sale liquor, no entertainment with Sunday sales, and off-sale growler license, liquor catering, and food catering licenses. The applicant is requesting a permanent expansion of premises. Freehouse is expanding their premises to include an area for recreation such as curling, shuffleboard, seasonally. Uh, Freehouse has been operating at this location since 2013. There is no change in entertainment. Uh, they are offering use of radio, television, electronically produced music, and jukebox. There is no change to their hours of operation, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 2 a.m., Saturday through Sunday, 7.30 a.m. to 2 a.m., 
for the interior. Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. Saturday through Sunday, 7.30 to 12 a.m. for their exterior. They have indoor seating for 252, outdoor seats for 118 on a private patio. On December 17th, public hearing notices were sent to residents and property owners within 450 feet of the premises. Multi-unit buildings were posted. Notices were also sent to the North Loop Neighborhood Association, the Warehouse District Business Association, and Councilmember Fletcher. We received no comments from the community. Uh, there have not been any significant 311 or police calls to the business. A revised SAC determination has been applied for and will be subject to payment once that is completed. Uh, the Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of a permanent expansion of premises for Loose Wiles Free House. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff on item number one? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open the public hearing on item number one, which is an expansion of premise for the free house. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? Please step forward, state your name and address for the record. Uh, g'day, my name's David Burley. Um, I own uh, Blue Plate and Free House. Um, yeah, we're, as Max said, we're putting in um, synthetic curling sheets and uh, like bags, beanbag toss and stuff like that. And it's just, it's sort of adjacent to our existing patio and it's in, in what we're calling the plaza, which is built by Nordic and United Properties. So it's sort of a, sort of a, sort of joint venture. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you for being here today. Cool. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Goodman. I'm happy to move approval of this. I think the neighborhood's pretty excited about this new outdoor space, uh, and uh, it's been well discussed in the neighborhood. And uh, I, we didn't get positive feedback. We didn't get feedback one way or the other off of the notices, but we certainly did get positive feedback uh, over the course of uh, many months of talking about it with the neighbors. So uh, thank you, and I'm looking forward to checking it out. Further comments or questions on the motion to approve? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on to item number two. Mr. Curtis, welcome. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. What you have before you is a request for passage of a resolution that would give preliminary and final approval to authorize up to $14.5 million in 501c3 tax exempt revenue bonds. The project is for KIPP, which stands for Knowledge is Power Program. Minnesota ABC, which is a company that would own the property. Uh, the transaction is for the benefit of the North Star Academy Charter School, which is at 5000 Oliver Avenue North. Um, this would be a purchase and some renovation of the facility. The school has been uh, founded in 2006, uh, opened in 2008, and uh, it currently has 475 students, K through eight. Uh, many of which qualify for uh, reduced lunches. Uh, there are many are mobile or homeless, and uh, most are 99% uh, students of color. Uh, I have representatives here, should any of you have any questions? Are there any questions for Mr. Curtis on item number two? Seeing none, thank you for your report. We'll open up the public hearing on the KIPP bond issuance on behalf of North Star Academy Charter School. This is preliminary and final approval to the issuance of up to $14.5 million in 501c3 tax exempt revenue bonds. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? You're all sitting there like, we don't want to say anything, but I would if I were you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Nicole Boardman. I'm the executive director for KIPP Minnesota, and we really thank you for your time and your consideration of this project. We really believe it will benefit our students tremendously in the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am happy to move approval of this item, and thank you all for the hard work that you do in Ward 4 and for the North Side. On the motion to approve by Council, Council Member Cunningham, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. We'll move on, and thank you for being here today. And we'll move on to our remaining item, which is a discussion item uh, noted on the agenda as item number 11. Mr. Frank, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We are happy to be here with you again this year and here with you today. <clears throat> I thought before uh, Eric gets up and presents a lot of work that he and his team worked on this summer, that I would just frame this for you just a little bit. 
Eric's been here, I think, a year, less than a year. And one of the things that he and I have been talking about since he arrived is the need to uh, evaluate our programs, to take a look at what we do and how we do it, to make sure that as much as we can, we are living up to the council adopted policies from the comprehensive plan, from our strategic and racial equity action plan. You'll hear from Joy Marsh Stevens, a committee of the whole uh, next week about the economic development work that we have been doing. And we wanted to make sure to the very ex maximum extent possible that the programs we have and our innovative new thinking and some new programs are in compliance with those, uh, with the policies and doing everything we can to advance our efforts towards inclusivity and equity and racial equity in particular. This is in keeping with what we are trying to do overall, and that's keep doing the great work we are doing, do more of it when we can, and to innovate new ways of, do, of serving businesses and residents in Minneapolis. So with a huge thank you to Eric and his team for the huge amount of work and outreach that they did to bring forward these recommendations and status report to you today, I'll, uh, I guess, introduce Eric Hansen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Mr. Hansen, thank you for being here. Can you introduce your team, please? All right. Well, if you, uh, Council Member Goodman and Council Members of the Committee, thank you for having me. If you give me a moment, we'll get to the team members, if that's okay. Um, as uh, David said, uh, we are, um, I've been in this job for just a little bit over a year, and when we came, when I came into this job, I have the very big opportunity to run a division um, that helps uh, small businesses and people um, work up the economic ladder. Uh, when I took the job in September of 2018, we were at the end of the Minneapolis 2040 adoption process and starting the, the I think, the substantive work of around the Strategic and Racial Equity Action Plan. Um, there's a number of programs that the city has had uh, to help support small businesses that we've been looking at, um, uh, that we've had in place in some cases since the 80s. And we haven't, hadn't done substantial review of those programs um, in a totality uh, for a number of years. And so one of the things that happened when I first started after talking to David and the team is an interest from not only from David but the members of our business development team to take a look at those programs with the impending changes with uh, Minneapolis 2040. Um, we also had the advantage of, of receiving the small business team at the beginning of this year into the division and how that aligns those business resources, small business resources aligns. So let me get started with the, uh, pr the presentation. We're gonna kind of give a little bit more of an overview, um, talk about what we found out in the, pro in the uh, report, in the review, talk about some recommendations. We'll go through the three key elements of this review, the lending programs, Great Streets programs, and the business technical assistance program, and then we'll talk about some action steps. Um, for those who want to see the report, we have a couple of copies here, but we also have, we'll be posting those online. They're on our LIM system for those watching at home. Um, this is a review of, of these programs on the, on the, um, on the screen, it is not a full evaluation. When we talked with the team, we thought it would be more useful to, to um, work across the partners in our system and with our professional understanding of the policies but also how these programs work to start to answer some of the questions and that we have and then um, uncover some of the questions that we still are um, don't have the answers to instead of undertaking a very costly, long-term, full evaluation that probably keep us with our heads down for multiple months, if not a year. Um, so this is the findings there. Mainly, um, one or more of the policies that come out of 2040 uh, relate to the, um, the programs that the city has uh, to support small businesses. You see those policies listed here on the screen. Also, I want to be very mindful of the economic development imperative in the Strategic and Racial Action Plan that looks at disparities between ownership of white-owned businesses and BIPOC-owned businesses, but not only to reduce that disparity, but to look at how do we support businesses to stay in business over time. So those are 
two different things. It's very straightforward to help somebody start a business. It's a much more complicated um, strategy to help them stay in business. And we're hopeful that some of the recommendations here move us towards that, better align us with um, those, not only those policies in 2040, but the strategic and racial equity action plan. So in this review, we asked these five questions. Um, we did this uh, with our partners. Um, I'm gonna go through our partners. We, we had uh, Zoe Teal, who runs our small business team, and Miles Mercer runs our business development team. And some of the staff, depending on the partners, went out and met with 22 providers, about 30 plus people in this group. You see their names on the list here. And we asked those questions about how it's going and what we could do to be more aligned with the policies of the city and be more impactful around our outcomes. We also used a lot of staff resources on this list with uh, Becky Shaw, Emily Peterson, Jim Terrell, Judy Moses, Lisa Passis, and Rebecca Perel, all on the business development team. Um, they uh, helped us with the kind of review of the interworkings of these programs as administrators, um, and they uh, reflect about, most of them won't like this, but decades of professional experience altogether. So can you just have the, those who okay. are here introduce themselves so everyone can see who okay. they are? Because I know people are taking the time to be here today, and I just want to make sure they get recognized. All right. Please. Zoe, stand up. Come on. Say hello. Come on up here, Mike. Hi. Uh, Zoe Teal, manager of the small business team. And Miles Mercer, manager of the business development team. You see Lisa in the back. Lisa, you want to say hello? <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Right. So let's talk about what we found out. Um, again, this is not an evaluation. This is a um, um, this is a you know just a review of our programs. So we're going to have some questions that are going to remain out of this uh, work. But we found that most of our programs do connect to 2040 in some way. We found that uh, while we did not have an intentional racial equity lens on most of our programs, except for the business and technical assistance program, uh, we are actually having some good outcomes where those, um, you know, where BIPOC owned businesses are, are actually being supported more than they are reflective in the, in the economy. We are basing that success on our, org our network of community-based organizations. It's those community-based organizations which we're really, uh, um, uh, we're really fortunate in the city of Minneapolis to have that have the ability to, to break through those cultural barriers that the city might have with businesses to really effectively um, deliver this uh, outcome. So we're, we're very fortunate to have these organizations um, helping us and being part of this, this kind of small business ecosystem. We also learned in this, in this study that uh, we, we do not have really accurate data on who we're serving. Um, we, don't, um, we don't have them across their, our uh, programs. We don't have them across the participants. We, we have sometimes lose the relationship with the businesses that have participated in programs. Um, and so we have to get better at that. And we also have found a number of questions that have come up that we still don't have the answers. And I'll go through a couple of those specifics as we go through the, the presentation. Um, so in, in general, uh, uh, kind of the, um, the, what we found out and what we would like to do is, is basically be better at, at tracking demographics. Um, as I said, and then um, working with these, this community-based organization around uh, increased collaboration, um, around uh, making sure that these organizations are sharing best practices because your relationship with the community-based organization will vary across the city and therefore your service will, will, will vary. Uh, we know that, that um, we touch about maybe 3% of the businesses through our small business programs. We have about 12 to 13% of the businesses have business licensing, so all together there's about 15% or so of the businesses have a relationship with, um, uh, with Minneapolis. So that's about um, 6,500 of the 40,000 businesses in Minneapolis, and those are, those are estimates, so um, there's a plus or minus in there. Um, so we don't, uh, and, and when we worked on the SRE program, we, we talked about it in the staff groups and with the uh, uh, policymakers about this idea of a secret handshake. 
you have to know to call the city or call these organizations or be aware of these resources in order to take advantage of them. And so the, the idea of, uh, around um, how we can better serve the small business community is to make sure that that handshake is no longer secret so that we can be very aligned and, and we can do that through uh, awareness and marketing. Um, and in some cases, we want to increase direct services. So one of the things that's been why we haven't had a long, um, a, a lot of evaluations of these programs is this is a city that's, that, that's been given a lot of permission by the council to be innovative as we go along. So in the case of the facade improvement program, for example, in areas that did not have service providers, there was identified need, the city and the staff um, Judy Moses and our staff actually administers direct branding to those um, uh, uh, to those businesses that would not be served by a community-based organization. And we have some other examples, but we we know that we have some opportunities to maybe fill in where those community-based organizations are not. And then we continue. We have to continue to look at the barriers. The small business lending programs and the small business supports programs of the city are only one tool in the economic development program for the city. We do not know all of the answers because we only know from our own experiences and our uh, professional, both our professional and personal lives. So we have to continue to work with our community-based partners, entrepreneurs that are in the community and, and, and just general community members about what barriers are out there. So let me talk about some programs. Here's, uh, we have, uh, we, we looked at five lending programs. The number one program, 90% of our activities in the 2% loan program. For those unfamiliar, 2% loan program is a participation loan program, which means we have a private entity, either a community-based organization or a bank or a private or a CDFI, a commercial lender, um, will we'll lend money to a, to a business and then the city will match up to that amount up to a cap, and it depends on where you are in the city, what that cap is. We'll just use $75,000 as, um, as, the, as the general cap uh, for this discussion today. Um, and that, uh, um, that program has been around since 1986. It's our, one of our oldest economic development programs in the city most long, with the most longevity. Um, the other programs we have, alternative financing, is, is similar to the 2% loan program, but it's sh Sharia compliant. Uh, so there is no interest if you're um, unable to, to, um, uh, to take interest in interest rate. We, we have a product for that. That program is, was used, um, was started about 10 years ago, was used right away, and then it has since drawn down. We've, we haven't had a lot of, of takers for that. We um, equate that to some of the organizations that have been um, administering those programs. African Development Center was our main um, uh, partner in that, in that product, and that uh, with an unfortunate passing of the executive director that kind of slowed the use of that tool, but it's uh, still an important one to have uh, for those who need it. Um, the other three, homegrown health and safety, uh, or the next two, homegrown and health and safety, have been used for specific um, uh, sectors in the economy. One is around uh, home, uh, smaller businesses that are food-based, and, and then the second one is, when, uh, is, is a partnership we have with the health department, where if you have a health code violation and you don't have the capital for it, uh, you can get a loan to, let's say, replace your hood and vent or what have you in the kitchen. Um, those two programs have been used very sparingly. In, in fact, the, the health and safety program has not been used, and, and we found in that case, typically people can find other cash to do the improvements, or they can use other loan programs um, for that, and we'll be talking about recommendations later. Uh, Mr. Hansen, yep. uh, Council Member Gordon has a question. Yes. And I could probably wait till the end too, but I, I was a little bit curious about the 2% loan program and um, the interest rate now, I mean, interest rate, rate over the years has fluctuated quite a bit. And is 2% a really great interest rate now or is that something people can find without um, the city helping them? That's a good question. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Gordon. Uh, yes, the interest rate continues to fluctuate so that private match would be at the, the bank set rate or the community partner rate. And ours is fixed at two percent. It ranges. I don't know what the you know somewhere. Let's five to eight percent maybe. Let's just use that as a range. It could go a, a little bit higher, a little bit lower depending on it. And then ours has been two percent. We have talked uh, periodically about is that the right rate? Um, we um, 
we can continue to, to ask that question. Right now, that is a pretty good interest rate. What it does is it blends the rate for the borrower, brings that cost of the capital down. Um, at this point, we're not recommending changing that rate. We're, we're actually mm -hmm. looking at some recommendations around the uses of the funding and the, um, the, the lending limits, but we're not, no, not contemplating the interest rate. In fact, it's you know, so widely known, um, it'd be, we'd have to get a new name for it. It sure is. It is attached to right. the name. Do, um, some people are suggesting that some loans would happen without us helping them. Uh, did we have a chance to pick that apart a little bit and right. see? Madam Chair, Councilmember Gordon, you're uh, jumping ahead in okay. the presentation, so let's uh, go right to that slide. <coughs> um, we find that you know overall, with connections to um, uh, to these programs, we're, we're effective at, at financing these like physical goods. So 2% has not been a working capital for those who are thinking about like payroll or, or you know, you're financing like some receivables, <coughs> those non-tangible assets in your, in your business plan. Um, the city's programs have been good for, you know, buying a piece of equipment or putting up tenant improvements in a building or in some cases, in very few cases, you know, maybe potentially buying, um, uh, maybe buying some uh, property. Uh, we, we found over the period of time, we have a very low default rate. It's like one or two percent sometimes. Um, so it's not, it's not very long. Um, we do have four, while all, all lenders can participate in it, we've had 40 uh, participate in the past, a bulk of it comes from five. And in those five, um, one of them is the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers, which is a community-based organization. Uh, the other four are community-based banks. Who are they? Um, they are... I'm a little ahead of my notes here. I don't want to leave anybody out. We have Venture Bank, um, Sunrise Bank, Northeast Bank, and Highland Bank um, are the primary lenders for our, this program. Um, and are they doing so under their federal requirements to meet certain guidelines for community development lending? Um, the, there's a number of ways to get to that um, to that metric with the um, with with the federal government, the federal requirements, but I would say that most of these banks are smaller, and look for small businesses. Um, they've been actually pre pretty big partners with the city's economic development programs for years because they're ones that will participate in the smaller, like corner stores and restaurants, and they they because they they have to generate that type of business. We um, we have in the past worked with the larger banks. Uh, their underwriting criteria is usually way too restrictive in their mind, so they have not participated. So you don't see like U.S. Bank and Wells Fargo in, in a lot of these deals. Usually that happens, you know, anecdotally, it's because that business already had a relationship and they want to use the program. But mostly the banks that are, are kind of um, moving uh, this product for us is, the, is those community-based banks. And, and that's, that, that makes sense because those small businesses have those relationships with those banks. And so, you know, this is where they put their deposit and the checking account, all that sort of things. And then when they need capital, they go to the to that bank and then um, their service there uh, as well. So uh, as far as kind of outcomes, I was, I was talking to you earlier about a third of the borrowers are BIPOC entrepreneurs, and that's higher than their proportional, proportionality in the, in the economy. Uh, but what's un, unnerving for us and a question that we have is the private match is 80% higher for white-owned businesses than BIPOC-owned businesses. And so we don't know enough information to intelligently tell you why that is different. We only have um, you know, speculation about why that's different, but that's a question that we still have on the table and want to figure out why. Um, and then the other thing that is important around uh, racial equity is we don't know the borrower pipeline. And what that means is we don't know how many people are not getting to the closing table they're asking for lend mo funding. They're asking to, you know, to um, to borrow money for for whatever business venture, and they never get there because the data we have are for loans that are being closed and not loans applications. So we're trying to figure out. We, we need to figure out a better way of 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 articulating what that pipeline is um, in that program. Um, so uh, to your question, Councilmember Gordon. The estimate from the interviews we had this summer is that half the deals would would not occur without the two percent loan program. So that you speculate that the other half would if there wasn't the two percent loan program. Um, so we don't know the answer necessarily to why that why there's you know 
it wouldn't have happened or wouldn't happen. Some of the reasons that we understand um, why people participate in is, one, it's, it is something that will finance a portion, so it frees up of like a, a physical need, and it frees up um, use of the funds for like working capital. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a collateral shortfall, it's just a little bit, and the, the, it's either to get the 2% loan program or the entrepreneur would have to bring the cash, especially in it's something, a larger deal that has a, maybe a real estate component to it. Um, so Mr. So, Hanson, do yes. we know that these smaller banks would actually make these loans without our match? Isn't there some kind of give and take on that where we feel good because the small bank does the underwriting so we don't have to staff that, but on the flip side, they don't take on all the risk because we offer a portion of the loan. So it's kind of symbiotic for both the bank and the city, correct? Right. There's, um, uh, there, there isn't, we need to know more about if the bank would do the loan on those other half, that half of, or not. Um, because that's just an estimate. That's something we, 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 we thought was interesting from our conversation and we didn't have, we, we need to tease out what that means. We do need the relationship. They do, um, we, we would, I would say this, is my recommendation would be to continue a participation loan program because people are more likely to pay back a private source than the city. We spend, we spend a lot of time doing that and they do the servicing for us. But it might be more expensive for the, um, for the business, and when I when I talk about this with like with Miles, um, he'll say it's we're we're helping not only them access capital, but to set them up for um, for success, because their their cost of of that loan is is less, and so they might have been able to just get the full loan from the bank, but if it's if it's a little bit gives them a little bit more cushion, because they get that you know that seventy five or so at two percent interest, um, that might actually mean that that business is in business for more years. Um, I so kind of want to drill down on though sure. whether or not they would do the loans at all. I mean big banks won't do the loans at all. So now we have small banks that do business with small um, businesses which is great but um, if we weren't providing some of the risk how do we know that they would do these loans at all? Um, Chair Goodman, do we, know that? We, we do not know the answer to that question. I, you know, Speculation is they probably wouldn't do some of the loans and some of the loans they would. They certainly wouldn't do the more risky loans because big banks won't even look at any of the loans, right. it sounds like. Have, have we talked to the banks about if we stopped doing this, if they would continue this level of lending? We did not ask that question, but it's, we're, um, we're, it's something that's still on the, uh, the it's when, when we're, we're trying to tease out what, what's this other half, that's a question we want to ask with the lenders. And, and take that into consideration to get more information around you know, the specific loans. So in the last, to give you kind of a sense of how many loans we did in the last five years, it's been about 200. So like it, we, would, we could take some time and go through each loan and figure out what the, what the information is. We, um, um, we, we don't know if that'll be fruitful or if it's just talking to the, um, to the underwriters and asking them you know, what, what are the thresholds you have and what are those that, how is this, how is this making it more of a deal that you would do, you know, the go, no, go point? So we're, um, we just, we, we're gonna continue to ask those questions as we go along uh, because we don't know the answer to them. Um, but we are seeing, you know, we're, we're seeing use of the program. So we know that they're, mm -hmm. at least they're using it and we're not oversubscribed. We use on average about 85% of our budget allocation. So that money comes back and, and, and since we have such a low default rate, that money all comes back or most of it comes back to the city and then it's being used for other places and then the city council is very generous to continue to give us that budget every year for that program so we're, we continue to use it. So we're kind of teasing out what the impacts would be because we don't know necessarily how that would impact um, the, the repayment rate, the risk level, the, you know, the, the, those are just the questions that came out of the review. And then with the MCCD loans, um, do they match those or we're giving them money to lend or they're going to lenders to get money, how does that work? Uh, Councilmember Goodman, the um, MCCD loans are, are just the same. They, they do match the fund. They have their own loan funds. Some of those loan funds um, have, have, were originated by some sources from the city and some are from their own, own sources. So if we weren't going to do it with MCCD, someone would have to have the ability to match those loans? If you want to do a participation loan, yes. Okay. Thanks. Councilmember Gordon. 
I have a little bit of a question. Uh, I'm curious about not knowing who applies for these loans. I think that's a piece of information that could be very concerning. I mean, you just look at the line where it says the private loan match is 80% higher for white borrowers. What makes me wonder, is there any disparity about somebody when they walk in to apply for a loan um, based on their race? How many people are denied and why? And so they don't actually apply directly to us for the 2% loan. Um, we have to wait till they apply to a bank or why don't we have that information? All right. uh, Councilmember Goodman, Councilmember Gordon, the, uh, um, the way it works is they'll apply to the, to the bank. So the bank will do the initial underwriting and then they'll send the deal to the city and then we'll review it. So there's not a direct application to the city for this. It's, that's um, the nature of a participation loan program. And that's some of the data that we need is mm -hmm. who is coming in that doesn't, that washes out through that system and doesn't get to the closing table. It's, it was a very, very early indicator of, 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 um, of, of something we need to continue to work on and find out what that pipeline is. That's, that is a consistency across all of this review and all the work we do is, is who's been left out, right? And how do you quantify that? And that's very challenging because not only is it the people who apply, like actually fill out an application, work with a, you know, a commercial banker, it's who walked into the bank or into the, the entity and was like, no, I'm gonna walk right back out. You know, we don't know that part too. So there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, I guess what we, I can say is we don't know the answer to it, but we have to keep probing to find out how, how to answer that question. Well, I'd agree that that information would really be valuable. And I also know we need information at the end of the line in terms of all of our programs about did it actually make a difference? Because I don't know that we necessarily track is somebody still in business five years later and all that and has the business grown or not? Did, it, did the loan do any good here or even the other programs? But so I want to emphasize getting that front end information would be really good. And I think the intention of this whole thing was to get um, access to capital p for people who couldn't get it otherwise. Um, and so if they don't know about it and they never get in the door or if they have to get through a bank qualified program first, that could make it harder too. And I, I think um, that's what everybody would agree. That's the intention of this is we want the city to come in and make a difference so that we can um, fill a void that right. isn't happening. Um, and particularly, I think now we're trying to look more through that racial equity lens, and so that's going to be even more challenging. But yeah. Councilmember Fletcher, thank you, Chair Goodman. Uh, so to make sure I understand, because I'm, I'm picturing uh, sort of a pie chart of the borrowers, and it looks not too far off from our city population uh, in terms of a third of borrowers uh, being Bi BIPOC business owners. Uh, but then if the 80%, it, if, if the private loan match is 80% higher, the amount of money we're leveraging for business owners, that pie chart would look very, very skewed. Um, we're leveraging a lot more money for white business owners. Uh, is, that, is that right? Yeah, Chair, Chair Goodman, Councilmember Fleischer, yes, that, that's correct. There's a, the, the deals are much larger on average. This is on average, remember, um, um, for white borrowers than non-white borrowers in that that causes a moment of like, why? Yeah, yeah. That feels like a really important mm -hmm. question for us to drill down on for sure. And then, I'm wondering if part of the answer isn't in that one to two percent default rate, because that I don't have enough experience giving these loans, so I'll defer to you. But that sounds like the kind of default rate you would that the commercial banks would be looking for. So it, it, it's hard for me to see where we don't. It, it feels like maybe we don't have a much lower threshold uh, to help people get into financing uh, than commercial banks because that feels like a pretty a, a pretty low risk set of loans that we're making. So I'm wondering if if there's evidence that we might be a little too conservative to achieve the goals of the program. If there's some adjustment that needs to be made in the barriers that we have uh, to qualify for these loans. Um, Chair Goodman, Councilmember Fletcher, what what I would say is we have to look we have to look at our business support in its totality. In some cases, uh, you, you might be right that the, the bank's underwriting criteria, even the community banks, is too restrictive, and that's why we're getting such a small default rate. Um, it also could be that we're not, you know, we're, we need to kind of expand um, the uses of the funding. So we, you'll see the bullets at the bottom talking about 
looking at working capital um, and uh, property acquisition for for businesses that own their buildings, and then uh, maybe you know vehicle purchases for those emerging businesses, you know, like food trucks, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so that it might be just in, inherent in that that case, but it also might be that the business a business has come in through a, a lender or MCCD or one of our community-based technical service providers and been, um, they've gone a different direction uh, to get technical assistance either through the full BTAP program or some other things and, and, and participated in programs that we don't participate. For example, MCCD has a working capital loan program that we don't participate in um, and that might be the, that's kind of the genesis of some of those, those um, those business relationships with with funders is, is that smaller like smaller loans, um, so it's possible that's it. And by the time we they're participating in this two percent loan program, these are maybe in that second stage or getting getting bigger. We we don't. I will agree. We don't know once. And to your point, uh, Councilmember Gordon, uh, we don't know what happens to a business <coughs> over a period of time. We don't have. If you participate in BTAP, we don't know if you've gotten a 2% loan program. We don't have that unified data set, that relationship management, which is gonna be important, especially if we're trying to track you over a period of time. So um, those are questions that we are gonna ask about. Um, is, the, is the lending restriction, you know, the, the underwriting criteria, you know, um, we have to remember that our, our, the organizations we're working with have regulations that they have to meet, so we, um, we wanna be supportive of them not breaking laws and that sort of thing. So we'll 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 work with them and um, about where we can find some flexibility. The recommendations that we have in the report talk about some some kind of initial first steps as we continue to gather some information to make it more streamlined. Um, and that's around lending limits, increasing lem lending limits, which, we, which would come back to the city council and and eligible uses. So just just kind of test it along with the other findings we have with the other two programs. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So we talked quickly about the Great Streets program. The Great Streets program was started in 2007. Um, the two core programs that we looked at were the Facade Improvement Program and the Business District Support Program. Um, the Facade Improvement Program is a matching grant that helps revitalize and sustain economic vitality of the city's commercial district. So it's basically improvements of frontages of, of businesses. Um, the business district support grants is, is a grant directly to the uh, to a community-based organization to do placemaking and um, other district and economic development work. Um, um, and you see the the different kinds of uses. the The top three are creative place marketplaces like farmers markets and that sort of thing, uh, community events, and then and then just overall awareness of you know places like uh, West Bank and uh, Northeast. Do you have a question about this? I just wanted to make a comment while oh, we yes. were on that slide, um, and I'll try not to comment on every slide and ask questions, but um, this is uh, a an issue that I've been thinking about for a long time since I've been on the council. If you look at where the second ward is, you'll see there aren't very many um, orange triangles. There's a strip of them that um, go through Lake Street, and there is a Lake Street Council, and there is a Longfellow Business Association there. But going north, even though there's Como Avenue and East Hennepin Avenue um, and University Avenue, there aren't very many facade improvements there because there's no business association serving the area, even though there is a, a commercial corridor. So my question is, and I've tried to get people together, I've even tried to allure Sewer Civic and Commerce Association or um, to, to consider serving a bigger area. They move more into Longfellow. Um, so I guess my question or the put out there is how can we help create um, civic associations or business associations where there are none? And you talked a little bit about how we do administer some of the loans, and that's the other option is how can we do better outreach? You can also look up in the, the, the fourth um, ward, and of course I'm not that familiar with the commercial corridors there, but there are probably a few, but there don't seem to be that many um, facade improvement loans there, and they, I'm not sure if they have a business um, District. So that's that's the other issue is could we do more to help them get created or get services uh, than we are now? And that's more a comment. And I know when we met privately, I talked about it too, but I wanted people to be aware of it here. Um, we we will look for, um, if there's a need, we'll look to fill that barrier. And that's the fourth ward is an example of that where we, we've directly administered facade grants because that lack of organization and uh, based on our conversation uh, with this map, identified that 
that area of the second ward as well. But um, that's where we're trying to be as innovative as possible to support these small businesses um, when there isn't a community-based organization. Um, so essentially what Great Streets does is it helps support our small business or our community-based organizations and gives them a tool to build relationships with businesses and to help market their districts and, um, and really be that network that we have. Um, we see usage of this program. We have an, as you know, we have an annual uh, RFP for most of these, um, or for both of these programs, and we're usually oversubscribed by hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's a, a big awareness of this program, but it also shows the value that the community-based organizations have. Um, uh, we do, we did, we do have some findings around um, how we administer the programs that might be barriers to some small businesses, especially in areas of historic property. Uh, where, where there's a match requirement, for example, that might be uh, too, um, too much for a business to take or the, just the way that we reimburse the costs. And so we're gonna be looking at that. And that was some advice we got from our community from, through our interviews about how to streamline it and, and make it more effective. Um, the council also was, was generous this year to allow us in, in cultural districts to expand the uses Right now, it's, ex it's exterior uses on the front of a building. Uh, we have gotten uh, numerous um, uh, uh, kind of complaints that we can't do like systems work inside of buildings and with uh, additional funding and, and um, policy direction from the council in the 2020 budget, we were able to do that in cultural districts and hopefully we'll see some success and then come back with some, um, su su some suggestions there. Uh, in business district support, the main issue that we're looking at is, is sometimes organizations are, are wanting to come back multiple years for, for the same thing. They want us to be a perpetual funder for something. Uh, sometimes there's some value to that, and sometimes it's like, let's, you know, let's put the money in different areas. Uh, we are gonna evaluate whether or not there's, a, there's an opening uh, from a policy standpoint to have maybe two different funds from BDS, and one of them is just like organizational support so that we have that network. Um, the value of the network in Minneapolis is when we need to deploy resources, they are additional, um, uh, they're kind of additional people on our, on our arsenal to go out and talk to businesses and help us with relationships. So when the small business team, for example, goes out, they can go out maybe with the organization and so it's, it's important for us to keep those relationships. The business technical assistance program was designed for um, racial equity. So 85% of the participants in BTAP are um, uh, BIPOC owned entrepreneurs. You can see kind of the distribution um, of the participation. Uh, we, have, uh, we have woeful uh, data and um, uh, uh, outcomes with Native American owned businesses. Um, you can see that throughout the report. It's almost non-existent. Um, if, if we see one percent, it's one. So um, we're, we're looking at why that is and, and what we can do to um, help support Native American owned businesses as well. So the um, overall BTAP only shows a portion of the businesses that are be being served. So for BTAP, the core program we, uh, the city council will approve uh, an allotment of funding for uh, community-based organizations and they provide the technical assistance and there's a, a menu of, of items that they can uh, bill towards, but it's only a portion of the, um, of the assistance that they provide. Most of, uh, of the businesses you can see are, um, you know, there's non-basic industries like uh, food-based retail, healthcare, and personal services. We're not sure where we're gonna get the next Medtronic out of this, you know, or Pillsbury. And so we're gonna think about that a little bit. It's like, what are we doing with uh, businesses that are having, you know, looking at producing and manufacturing and, and that sort of thing. Um, these might be the early starts of those serial entrepreneurs who start a business in, in you know, maybe healthcare or, or, you know, open a restaurant and then move on from there. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, uh, our use of CDBG funding sometimes can be a restriction and then we get, as with all programs, it depends on who you're working with and what kind of level of service you have. Um, uh, again, tracking um, and just awareness of the program are consistent with, with, with BTAP. So what are we gonna do about it? First of all, um, I wanna let you all know that the BTAP program is now part of the small business team. When we did SREAP, we did the process mapping, and the positive thing is the small business team 
phone number is that there is a building awareness of that phone number and there's a building awareness with the policy leaders of the small business team being there. And so they'll get a number of calls a year and it uh, increases, still not a lot, but they'll get some calls, continues to increase and they, have, they, they go one of two directions. One, they go inside the city hall. They try and figure out how to get a license or um, whether they need an encroachment permit or you know, just those kind of process improvements and, 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 and just kind of the ombudsman person role, the navigation of the city system. The other one is about technical assistance. They'll call and they'll ask, how do I start my business? Where are the resources? And when we were doing the SREAP, we, we found that there was, a, there was a warm handoff, and at that point in time, the small business team was in the coordinator's office, warm handoff to the, to the BTAP, but there was no system to track what happened to that business once it was, was um, handed off to the provider, or, or um, in some cases, it was just, here are some providers you might want to think about, and we never managed it. So we've made the decision to put the small business team with the, or the BTAP program with the small business team so they can manage both of those relationships and start to build awareness that your first call for uh, business assistance in Minneapolis is the small business team and they'll help you navigate whether you need the technical assistance or whether you need the navigation assistance or access to the other resources that we have in the city, that's your first place to start. Um, the city council was very generous this year in adding an, another business outreach specialist that we'll be hiring this year. So we'll have three on staff that will also be doing some proactive uh, business calls in our business districts. Uh, so we're, we're, we're working on that plan as well. So um, uh, we're gonna make some program modifications. Those programs are, are list, those modifications I have, um, general modifications, um, let me look at what I have here. Um, is, is around marketing and um, you know, written, uh, data collection. Um, and then we have to think about who, what's the appropriate role of our external partners. We do an ad hoc relationship. We also have the business advisory group that reports to the council from time to time. And what, what is the right uh, time to, to uh, wh who are the appropriate people that we need to continue to work with and when. Um, we also wanna set up kind of a, some regularity to why, how we're, we're, we're checking in on how the programs are. This has been done you know, for the first time in a while. And I don't know how long a while is, it's hard for me to plan for that. So we wanna um, set a kind of a system of when we look at these programs, whether it's yearly or every five years or so, um, and report back to the city council. From, with respect to program changes, you'll see in the report, uh, we're looking at some loan limit and changes to the 2% loan program. Uh, we need to, as I mentioned, align some of the Great Streets program. One of the things we need to come to the City Council is the, uh, the facade program is a geographically based program based on the last uh, uh, comprehensive plan. And as we all know, the 2040 plan has changed all those geographies and so we have to align that program with it and then um, with those budget items around eligible uses. Uh, we are gonna continue to review the program guidelines and see if we can make improvements to the contracting and make it a little bit more easy for businesses that are trying to stay in business and you know, do the day to day to not have to have a burden of the uh, city contracting requirements. In BTAP, um, we talked about uh, um, um, the refinement of the contracting uh, with, um, with service providers and, and maybe serving more folks. And then the other thing that came out of the 2020 budget was some additional support for co-ops. Uh, the, the city council was also generous to us with some funding to help with co-ops. We have a co-op technical assistance program. In that program, it helps the, um, around um, how, to, how to start a co-op. The funding that the city council and the mayor provided to us this year helps us with the transactional cost of, it, of establishing that co-op. And we're working with Nexus Community Partners around um, a, a program development. So I just wanted to mention that because that's something that will be coming forward. Um, and then from our other programs, we're, we're talking about maintaining those alternative financing permit homegrown. We, we do not get anybody using the um, uh, health and safety. We're, we're gonna be coming forward with a recommendation about uh, discontinuing that program, but we do that together with the health department. So we'll work with them on that. Um, and then I wanna mention the commercial property development fund. So. Again, the city council put $2.7 million into the economic development budget to help with uh, financial equity gaps in real estate projects in cultural districts. And we'll be refining, uh, coming 
forward in the first quarter of this year with some guidelines for that program and, and hopefully some initial um, uh, requests for uh, a designation of those funds. So um, Councilmember Fletcher had a question. Okay. Thank you, Chair Goodman. So thinking about the, um, so the way this report was structured really looks at uh, external partners, so the people who are kind of initiating these loans or helping us uh, provide these services, and we got feedback from them. But I'm wondering, in thinking about the recommendation for the 2% loans that we raised the limits, uh, I'm wondering if that was generated out of business feedback, and I'm especially interested in our analysis about if the people getting the um, higher dollar value loans and leveraging more money out of these loans are mostly white business owners. How does that recommendation square with a racial equity approach to uh, trying to support people of color entrepreneurs, uh, would it be more that we want to try to get more smaller dollar loans out the door uh, in more strategic ways rather than raising the limits if that's sort of how that's playing out? Chair Goodman, Councilmember Fletcher, um, the, we, we did go to the providers. We also uh, used um, our staff team, uh, which has connection not, not only to the providers but also to the business community, um, and we've we're, we've received uh, feedback from businesses. I don't have the specifics on how many businesses about the lending limits as an issue. The recommendation that we're proposing is uh, around uh, property ownership uh, for um, for those uh, businesses that are trying to be owner occupants and and create some a wealth building tool. One of the things that's, that's going to restrict the city is the small uh, the uh, business subsidy act, and it's going to be a need to have an ordinance change in order to do it. So we're 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 saying that there's probably we need more access to capital. We need more guidelines about who would be able to access that capital. So, in the case that you re reference, if it's somebody who's just doing a big deal and they just want seventy five thousand dollars, we probably would say that's the cap for that. Um, but in a case where you wanted to buy a building, let's say on on the corner of um, Lake and Bloomington, um, and you, that might be where we would have the extended gap. So those things are still being worked out, but um, we have heard that is a need, um, not only the, the different types of capital, but the, the access to it. We're also looking at the what, what would be the value of, of adding working capital as part of an eligible use, uh, not only in the 2% loan program, but also is, is there an opening for, for, a two for a working capital program from the city? Uh, Council Member Ellison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I, uh, I think it's incredibly helpful and I'm glad that we are looking at um, figuring out how we, how we proceed forward and make some changes. I'm also incredibly sick, so sorry if I sound a little phlegmy. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to like dis disinfect this microphone after. Um, uh, was curious, uh, uh, before um, both of our times here, I know that the innovation team engaged in a review of some of this work as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and I also uh, definitely trust your team's ability to review and evaluate these programs, but also uh, it can be helpful to have sort of like that, that third set of eyes. Um, how have you guys engaged with the innovation team considering the work that they did in 2016 um, as you proceed in this, in this work? Chair Goodman, Councilmember Ellison, uh, you sound great, by the way. Um, what I would say is we poached the innovation team person to lead the small business team. So whoever did that before I got here, bravo. So I have really close connection to that report. So um, we are open to advice, you know, on what we're doing. Again, like I said, we can only we can only determine what we know from our own experiences, both personal and professional. And so we need to continue to expand the voices that help us with the identification of the barriers um, and then maybe some possible solutions. Um, one of the, I think the, the benefits of just doing this review is we're not coming in with, with a bunch of set like, here's what you need to do. We've been working on this for two years. It's here's some things that we're thinking about. We're gonna come and get more information and come back to you. And so there's openness from our team um, to take that kind of feedback and get those other other eyes on it that you see. So if you think that it was too, if there was too many of the providers and you want us to talk to other people, we will definitely do that um, as we develop it. And that's why we have that 
uh, recommendation about how, how do we have our external partners? When, when do we talk to them? And it's not simply just the providers, it's how do we get businesses involved? How do we get um, you know, just you know, community members involved that might not necessarily participate in our programs because they're, they're at the ground, they're seeing the barriers, they're, um, they're being impacted by them and, and we, we benefit from that advice. Uh, <clears throat> there's two other things. Um, one is uh, uh, we've got you guys have uh, have a, a, a list of next steps based on this initial review that I think are great. I'm excited to um, see us pursue all of them. Uh, what's the next steps in terms of uh, a deeper level of evaluation? You, you know, at the beginning you said this is this is an, an evaluation. This is sort of a review of what we're doing. It sounds like we've already sort of indicated that there are some some practice changes that can be ha that can be made just from the initial review. Uh, what are the next steps in terms of that deeper evaluation? Right. <coughs> Chair Gubin and Councilmember Ellison, uh, we will um, we'll be developing that with the teams. So you see, there's a we identified actors and teams that will these will nest under in the in the report. We also talked about you know things that are that require council. We we believe require council action. The ones that can be staff will be coming back to you with some 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 periodic reports. The main questions that we talked about at length here, we're gonna be looking at how to effectively answer that question. But ultimately we wanna make some, it's a lot of work here. It's a definitely a lot of work here. Um, we have um, some opportunity for some improvement. We wanna, we wanna get some of those things that we can do quickly done and then look at those longer term those the long term issues. One of the things I think that's, that's really important to be first step is how are we collecting the data and how are we managing the relationships with those businesses? So when a business does come in, we know who they are, and we have that, you know, we can start the track, and then we can start asking those, those larger questions about that other 50%, what's the, what, what gives with that? And, and, and we might find in the, because we're, again, we're not, we don't know all the answers, we might find that they're very reasonable, um, uh, there's a very reasonable answers to why they estimated 50% wouldn't come, wouldn't happen, in, 50% do, but there is a, you know, in my mind, um, that 80% between white and non-white borrowers that match, um, that uh, that that really causes me to pause. So I'm I'm very interested in that question right off the bat. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, Councilmember Cunningham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a slew of questions, uh, which is very on brand. Um, first, I just want to say that uh, this was a really great report. Um, I love a good logic model, and so I really appreciate the breakdown of what the inputs are, what the activities are, what the outputs are, and what exactly does success look like in, in each of these programs. So that's really helpful um, and really increases transparency. Um, like I said, this overall was a, a really great report. I have some specific programmatic questions and then some higher level questions. So um, in terms of Great Streets, um, both with the facade and the business district support program um, programs, the um, there is an assumption that there is already a business association. We filled the gap in Ward Four um, with the city being a direct um, provider, you know, lender and or provider in yep. that way. Um, but I also feel like there's an opportunity for the community to have more agency by supporting the development of a business association so that there is more agency. So um, one of the questions that I had is, uh, is it possible for the business district support program to be utilized for starting a new business association? Right. Chair Goodman, Council Member Cunningham. Um, I'm, don't quote me on all the eligible and ineligible uses, but we would be able to support, I'm just trying to think about use of the program in the past, and I do mm -hmm. believe we've supported some some younger organizations. Um, but if well, I think what we have to look at is, is we have identified that there are areas of, of the city that do not have that service provider. And if there is the capacity and the will, I think we can make some modifications if it's not an ineligible use um, to help support that because ultimately we're not gonna see those triangles, those yellow triangles come up in the fourth and the second ward as you've identified, thank you so much. Um, if we don't have, you know, as effectively if we don't have those community-based organizations. So if we're, if, if we're there to support them, um, I, think, 
think we could come back if it's so. I'm just going to speak off the top cuff if we could probably figure out a way to do that. Okay, that's helpful. That's one of the things that I've heard just incredibly frequently from uh, Ward 4 business owners is that they wish that there was more of an organizing mechanism for them. And so um, I've been trying to provide some support, and so it's helpful to know that we can be um, provide more support in that way as well. Um, I know that in the Great Streets facade program that um, one of the findings is that multiple administrators indicated that the biggest barrier to accessing the program was for BIPOC business owners in uh, to find availability with matching funds. I just want to confirm that because that is something that I have frequently heard um, is the and, and the question that I have is right now it's tiered um, based on uh, various factors around the location and things like that. And because of the fact that I in Ward 4, we don't have any major corridors except for Lowry. Mm -hmm. um, we had we, were, we had a higher requirement for matching dollars. So is that still going to be the case moving forward? Or are we looking at, like what, because from my perspective, that is not equitable. Right. If in Ward 4, we have to have a higher amount of matching dollars. So I'm curious, like, is that going to be the case moving forward? And what does racial equity look like within that? Uh, Chair Goodman, Councilmember Cunningham, you're right. The Great Streets program is a geographically based program based on the last comp plan. And in those geogra geographies, they're on three different levels. They have three different categories based on need and some other metrics. Those, th those um, rankings, those different categories, will no longer be valid because those geographies are not that valid. So we've talked uh, initially about how, if we do take a racial equity lens on it, one is we're, 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 we'll be back to your committee, to this committee very soon, maybe even in two weeks, but probably like a month, to talk about expanding the geographies to, so that uh, our programs are consistent with 2040. But how do we, um, to rank them? And maybe the, you know, we're, we've, we've gotten um, some advice from, from businesses and, and from providers around that ranking is, is kind of problematic, council members as well have an issue with the ranking, so maybe we do, maybe that's just, you know, a relic of the past in the old program. Um, but we have to take the, if we're, if we're being mindful of the, pro, the policies in 2040 and SREAP, we have to take that racial equ equity lens and apply it. So maybe there's a preference or um, maybe there's a way to, to finesse it where we're, we're looking at areas of historic areas of poverty or opportunity zones or, um, promise zones or it's you know it's for ownership or whatever we might have a different metric for that and we will be we'll have to develop that with our community-based partners and then your final question about the match that is definitely true we have heard that um, we've heard about it's not only the match but the use so we've heard the use of like well I don't need a new sign if the heat doesn't work and that's what I need the money for and this grant program does not do that until now with the cultural districts, and maybe that's where we pilot it, and then we, we can expand it through the council, or through the city if the council is agreeable to that, but let's, let's test it out first, because that means it's gonna be more significant um, cost to the program, and so that might have a, Im another impact that we're not prepared for um, until we see how it's being used. So we're looking at that, and that was identified by, by multiple organizations that not only getting access to the match, but the fact that we reimburse, the program is a reimbursement model. So you have to put all the money up front and then get reimbursed. So we're looking at, at those as, as significant barriers and how do we reduce those with still you know, being mindful of this is a government program. Thank you. Um, in the uh, recommendations for the Great Streets Facade um, program, I also would recommend um, for consideration of tracking data of displaced businesses. One of the concerns that I have is if we have a property owner who accesses these dollars, um, they can displace the current businesses that are there and charge higher rent. So I would be curious to see um, that data point to see like does that actually help ground the businesses that are currently there or does it actually displace them for higher rent? So just uh, for that. Okay. And then um, last couple questions. The um, Association for Enterprise Opportunities did um, a large research study on black owned businesses and they found three gaps. Uh, a lack of initial wealth um, going into yeah. 
the business. Um, the second is a lack of good credit. And the third is a lack of trust with government and banking systems. So my, cure, so my question is, how are the small business programs working to address these gaps? Chair Goodman, Councilmember Cunningham, we understand those as being barriers. Those are the things that we need to tease out. I can't, I can't definitively tell you. That's why I didn't share uh, barriers like that. But yes, the you know credit ratings and um, you know family wealth and and just you know the bias in the lending system are real barriers. And that's the question about like what's wh wh why is it eighty percent higher? You know, like that. Let's let's get to that that. To that answer, uh, so we can give you more, um, I think, accurate and um, rooted in, in data uh, uh, um, suggestions and recommendations. But it's it is is definitely something we need to address. Um, and then you know, long term, you know, these some of these smaller businesses that are finally getting access to capital, they might be our next Medtronics. And so, what are we doing about that? So there's there's a longer thing, and how do we b build that trust over time? Uh, especially with uh, if you're going into a community-based organization that has that cultural competence that the city might not have, and you build that relationship with it, but you're moving into the next phase and maybe into uh, you know a, a private commercial banking relationship, how are we making sure that there's a cultural competence along that system so that they don't wash out? Last question, if that's okay. Um, so I know that, um, thank you for that. I, I know that um, the programs don't have explicit goals around racial equity, but it really is producing those sort of outcomes that we're seeing. Um, one of the concerns that I have is um, by not having that institutionalized, it's really based on then the judgment of the current staff members that we have. And so um, does the disparity study help us be able to make racially conscious goals um, because we know that if it's race neutral that inherently then benefits disproportionately white owned businesses so um, I I know that you have good folks on staff and I trust your hiring process but if we don't institutionalize it then it's personality based so I'm just curious as to um, is there, are there conversations happening around how do we make these actually explicit racial equity goals as well as, um, because that probably then will shape more kind of how the right. programs operate and uh, does the disparity study help us be able to legally make race right. conscious right. programming? Chair, Council Member Cunningham, um, we, maybe I wasn't as, as explicit as I should be is, the, the, the programs now aren't racially specific, but we, we have now the SRE program that you, we need to be more mindful of that and we need to be explicit. We need to institutionalize um, how these programs are addressing those disparities so that it isn't personality-based. So it's a, it's a good point, and I just want to clarify that. Um, I think as uh, when David uh, first spoke before the start of this presentation, um, we, we take this very seriously. Um, we're, with um, with respect to how our outcomes are, are being based, um, you know, it's we, we believe that the charge of this division and this department, and honestly, the city, is to reduce the disparities we see in the community, and that's this is one of those tools. Um, but you're right; it needs to be. We need to we need to be very uh, explicit about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and to identify the barriers and take them down, and why we're we're, we're getting to it. Um, I don't have the specifics for you today, but that's. This is the start, and we will, uh, not the start, the next step, I'll just say the next step, but we're ver working closely with the SREAP team, the race and equity team, um, and you'll hear that next week at the Committee of the Whole around the SREAP goals. But I see those SREAP goals as more, is just as, as the first step, and what are we doing um, as a system in a city and an enterprise to reduce uh, some of those institutional barriers around the markets um, in these areas of poverty? Thank you so much. Council Member Gordon followed by Council Member Fletcher. Thank you and I just want to um, uh, acknowledge what a great conversation this has been, what a great presentation. I think it's probably overdue that we have this kind of review and we start to dig into these programs but it's really timely now because of the comp plan and because of our racial equity action plan so I think that this is really going to be beneficial and I look forward to 
hearing the um, refined improvements as we come maybe program by program. I mean, this could easily be a year-long project yeah. when we look at things, and we'll maybe we'll look at one program at a time for what, how do we want to change these guidelines. It sounds like great streets might be coming up soon. Um, one thing I want to suggest would be nice to have in place somehow along the way is some kind of a larger um, external group um, <coughs> of people who hold business licenses or maybe have participated in programs or maybe the um, business associations or those um, yeah. CDCs who are providing services to them, a chance to meet and review and look at it and have input. And I know we've had informal, not so functional, fairly well functioning groups that have met before and it's really helpful for all of us and policymakers to take ideas to them too. But um, think about that in the process. How could we have a, and I'm not saying that it needs to be a city open appointments process group to get set up necessarily either. I've dreamed of the day that small business associations might create their own citywide associations of associations, but they don't. Uh, that's a big challenge, of course, and hasn't really happened. Um, but but um, maybe it could. So. I think that will help inform us with the work as we're going forward, the more we can reach out to those external stakeholders and feel like we're really understanding um, what the businesses think we need. But um, I'm excited about digging into this more, really appreciate it. I'll move to receive and file the report for the committee here and, um, and thank you very much, and you and your team for all your work. Great, thank you, Councilmember Gordon. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Goodman, and thanks for this report. I really did find it useful and I think there's a lot of good work represented here. I'm interested to hear what the recommendations are coming back. Um, but one thing I want to just, like if we step back and think really big picture uh, and you think about compared to other cities or compared to, you know, uh, uh, if you think about a city of our size and how many businesses we have, um, is the number of businesses that we're serving with these programs enough? Is it a lot? Is it, um, should we be doing more? It kind of feels like, um, to me, uh, like I'd love to see higher numbers where we're reaching more people and helping more people uh, own a little piece of our economy, right. uh, which is always the goal of this work, right? When we're uh, supporting small businesses. So I guess I'm curious about your perspective on just how much work does this represent and, and is, it a, is it an outcome that we should feel good about or should we be striving to do more? Um, Chair Goodman, Councilman Fletcher, I think we should feel good about the, the, the investments we're making into the economy and the small businesses in Minneapolis. Um, uh, we still have some ways to go. We do not touch a lot of businesses in, in these programs, and sometimes it's because we don't have a role. So we have to always mo monitor what's the appropriate role of the city in these programs. But we'll, we'll learn more about that as we build this awareness campaign about, uh, and, and you know, take away that secret handshake and see if there's more businesses that start calling the small business team or reaching out to the community-based organizations. And maybe with this uh, work around refining how we our processes are, we might actually see that we are serving a lot more businesses just off of the top because we have taken away some of the bureaucratic red tape. So I think it should be more, but I don't know what the, the perfect number is. Um, so Councilmember Gordon has made a motion to receive and file. I just have a comment sure. um, and a question. My question has to do with the home of all of these various lending programs. So there's a pretty successful and large green cost share program. As an example, it's a loan program. Why is it not in the PED loan economic development section? That would be something that I would think we should be looking at trying to have everything in one place. If we already have a situation with kind of disparate information across various organizations and programs, I would think that we should just be thinking about that. And other loan programs that are operating in other departments, I would hope Mr. Frank and his team can maybe look at that. Okay. Um, the other thing I just want to note is um, multiple times, and I'm sure this is just because you're um, nervous, you, you keep thanking us for putting money into the budget for this, that, mm -hmm. and the other thing. And I take issue with that because big deal, we put money into it. We're not doing the work on a daily basis like your staff are. And so I view it as we're all in this together and that the professional staff are working with businesses to try to determine what we as an enterprise collectively can do. Mm -hmm. And our role is to determine if the feedback is good and if it is because we have responsibility for part of the budget, then we should fund that. And so I know you mean to be nice by saying thank you for funding this, that, and the other thing, but the thank you really goes to the staff who do the work 
who determine what the needs are, who bring these recommendations to us. Everyone has their part in the process, and our part is to believe in the people who are running the organizations, running the organization, hiring the correct people who are working with people on the ground. The, when I stop by the Bryn Mawr Deli, I'm sure for like a lottery ticket, and he told me that his freezer wasn't working and his facade was falling down and that he was thinking about selling his business because he couldn't sell tobacco anymore. I didn't know what to say other than maybe I'll buy another lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. I suggested that he call Zoe and Zoe reached out to him before I could even get to you, get him to you. And uh, Zoe made him feel like he was part of the economy in mm -hmm. the city of Minneapolis. I didn't do that. All I did was make a connection from one person to another. So I think it's important for all of us to realize that we're all marching towards the beat of the same drummer, right. which is economic inclusion, as identified by the mayor and city councils, one of the top three priorities in the city. Mm -hmm. Economic inclusion has a very broad brush, and it's up to us to put our money where our mouth is in funding it. If we want to do more loans, we should put more money into it. If we want to give people grants and we want to do microloans, we should put more money into it. Sure, your staff could make the recommendation, but I'm sure Mr. Frank made five dozen recommendations that were not taken as part of the budget system. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to remind us that everyone does their part right. in the larger picture of bringing economic inclusion to the city. And I want to thank you for your part. And I want to thank my colleagues for all of our part in trying to fund the things that we think are important. But ultimately, we're all on the same team. You don't need to thank us for the work that we're doing. We should be thanking you for the work that you're doing in order to help residents. And I know that small businesses that have had an experience or an interaction with the city, many of them have had really good experiences, whether it be through licensing or getting some level of assistance or participating in a business association. There's a lot to celebrate in this report at the same time that we can make changes right. and do things differently and not be afraid of that either. So I appreciate um, your comments. I think you've done a really good job with your team. You've been here about a year to take on even a small evaluation says that you felt we could do things differently. So did people on your team. We want to support you in that work. You don't have to say anything else. I, I, I was just going to say, have a good day. <laughs> On Councilmember Gordon's motion to approve the staff recommendation with the acknowledgement that there is more work to do and we are going to be enthusiastic partners with you. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Seeing no further business before us, we are adjourned.